Good morning, parents and guardians and families. Thank you for joining us this morning on our parent training session. Today, Miss Elizabeth Gian Gianolis, <laughs> the director of multiple tiered systems of support, will provide a great presentation on social emotional learning begins at home. So I will turn it over to you, Miss Elizabeth. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And I promise you the most challenging part of this presentation will be my last name. So the rest of it should be pretty easy for folks to follow. So it's Janulis, which is a hard one. Um, but we're, we'll go ahead and get started. I'm really happy to present and, and share some information with you all today. I know that this time has been very stressful for all of us. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. So let me do that quickly. And then we'll get started and there'll be lots of opportunities for questions at the end. And if you have a, a question or a comment, you can also feel free to write it in the chat um, or even use the raise your hand feature, whatever works best for you. Um, so that way you can ask your question. So here we go. Let's do this and then let's share. All right. So the title of the presentation, Social Emotional Learning Begins at Home, Supporting Social Emotional Learning During COVID-19. So that's a bit of a mouthful, but let's start with really what social emotional learning is. So social emotional learning is often defined by an organization that really is at the forefront of this. It's called CASEL, the Collaborative for Academic and Social Emotional Learning, as a process through which we manage our emotions, we set and achieve goals, feel and show empathy, um, establish and maintain positive relationships and make responsible decisions. So that's a lot. But another way that it's often described is as soft skills. But I'd rather, instead of calling them soft skills, want us to think of it as the essential skills. Really the essential skills to be successful, not only just in school, um, but in relationships, later in work, and just generally in life. Because you can think about it this way. One of our kids could do very well in school, could get into a great college, but you know, are they going to succeed at college if they have a hard time getting along with others? Will they be able to get that job even if they're qualified on paper, if they have difficulty interviewing? Um, will they be able to have healthy relationships with friends um, when they're older with a spouse? You know, so these quote unquote soft skills are really the essential skills for life. So they're really important. Okay. And then I also want to draw some attention to COVID. Um, so it's almost been 11 months. And during this 11 months, it's been a bit of a roller coaster for all of us with our emotions, for us, for our kids. And I want us to think about that. This has been a long time, right? And it's still ongoing. So typically when we're thinking about or talking about stressors, we're talking in the past tense, but this is still ongoing. So I want us just to be mindful of that. Another thing I want us to be mindful of is that during this time and our emotions, they've been like a roller coaster. There's also been a lot of confusion, right? So COVID is something that's brand new for all of us. We, ne we don't exactly have a script for it. Um, it's new, it, it's evolving, and we've certainly have been getting lots of different information. Um, sometimes that's mixed or polar opposite messages, right? So that's definitely been confusing. Another thing that's sort of unique about COVID is that it's been a big challenge on our support system. So generally when we're going through step stress or when our kids are going through stress, we have a really good support network of friends and family, loved ones that we can turn to, our schools that we can turn to. But because of social distancing and some of the unique things about COVID, that's been a bit more challenging for us to lean on our support system in the same way. So maybe we're using the phone or or you know using um, FaceTime or something like that rather than having that in person which is just we all know not quite the same and finally COVID is unique in that it's impacted our everyday life um, so not only distance learning but if you are working from home um, unfortunately many people have lost their jobs during this time um, everything just looks different right and for our kids we really want to just be aware that their daily life has changed 
dramatically, right? So they're not going to school in person. Most of them aren't involved in after school activities or sports. They're not necessarily seeing their extended family members who maybe they're used to seeing on a regular basis or having play dates or spending time with friends, right? So that really puts a lot of stressors on our kids who are more vulnerable to stress in the first place. Okay, so just to sort of be aware of that. Um, so today when we're talking about social emotional learning and when we're talking about these things, I want us to not think about COVID in terms of, you know, physical safety. Instead, I want us to think of it from the side of emotional safety. Okay, so let's take a look at this together. And this is really important. So this is a typical stress response. Okay, so normally what happens, the typical baseline's at the bottom is that usually when there's a stressor, we have this big resiliency window and our kids have this big resiliency window and they have an opportunity and we have an opportunity to calm ourselves before we react and lose it. Unfortunately, during very stressful times or also during times of trauma, which COVID has been for many of us, especially if we've experienced loss, that resiliency window shrinks. Okay, so another way to think about this is if you're having a really stressful day, so you're very stressed out, maybe work has been stressful, maybe your kids are just having a hard time or you have a toddler and your toddler's throwing lots of tantrums and you have a deadline and you're just really stressed out. Normally a typical thing that somebody does, like let's say your spouse says something to you and normally it would be a little bit of an annoyance, but you're really stressed out, right? So something that they say, your resiliency windows, it, it shrunk quite a bit and you're more likely to what we call flip your lid or maybe lose your cool, okay? So there's a reason for that. And so if we actually want to talk for a second about the biology of all of it, because this is kind of fun to do with our kids. So you can show your kids that their brain, they can make a model of that with their hand. So all they need is their hand here. And instead of making a normal fist, you know, with your thumb out here, your thumb's going to be tucked inside. So this part is our brainstem. This is the beginning parts of our brain. It's where we don't think, we just react. This is our limbic system, our emotional part of our brain and memory, and this is our amygdala, which fires when we're under stress or have a big, heavy emotion. And this is our cortex and our prefrontal cortex right here. So this part of our brain helps us to stop and think, to have emotional control, to do multiple tasks at once. But when we're under stress or if there's a big stressor, we can flip our lid. So what I'm trying to say is when there's a lot of stressors, our ability to stop and think and reason and use this part of our brain is really diminished and we're more likely to do this. So our ultimate goal for our kids during this time is really to give them the tools to build and widen that resiliency window. Okay, so we know that it's probably not its normal size. It's shrunk quite a bit due to all of these stressors. So we wanna help them widen it so they're more likely to be able to stay um, regulated they're more likely to be able to have those skills that are necessary to be successful in life, okay? So the big thing to think about is what can we do? And the first thing is probably not what you're expecting, but the most important thing we can do to help our kids is to first take care of ourselves, okay? This is so important because our kids look to us and look to see how we react and how we respond. And as parents and caregivers, we often think about putting ourselves last on the totem pole, right? We're taking care of everybody else first. We're putting the oxygen mask on our kids first, but just like they say, when you, um, you know, take flight, you actually have to put it on yourself first to be able to take care of others, okay? So some basic things to think about, and these might seem really basic, but I don't want us to get caught and bogged down by when we hear about self-care, um, it used to be really popular on you know, Instagram and Facebook and it would show all these people, they would put hashtag self-care and they would be going to these exotic places or getting manicures and pedicures or getting a, you know, a massage. It doesn't have to be that extravagant. It really is pretty basic. So we're talking about making sure that we're getting enough sleep, right? So that sounds easy, but I'm sure a lot of us don't regularly get about eight hours of sleep, right? And that's so important because when we get enough sleep, we're able to be more present and more regulated for our kids, okay? And so something that's sort of interesting that I like to remind myself of is that if you get 
if you average, let's say six hours of sleep per night, which is probably like a lot of us here, that's actually equivalent to having a 0.1% um, blood alcohol level. So that's a little scary, right? So we wanna make sure that we're getting enough sleep and doing what we need to do to create that environment. So whether that is having some time to relax beforehand, um, you know, if we're stressed, maybe journaling before we go to bed, turning off the TV, whatever we need to do. Also making sure that we're getting time for movement, right? So hopefully we're able to get outside a little bit and move so we can take care of ourselves. Having time for joy. So whatever it is that's fun and relaxing and restorative for you, and that we're carving out a little bit of time for that. And again, it's much easier said than done. I shared with some colleagues recently that I read an article that said, that recommends that you wake up an hour before your kids and you carve out that time for yourself. Um, and that to me is way too stressful, right? So I could maybe do 15 minutes, that might work, but I don't wanna wake up at 4.30 or five o'clock in the morning, right? That, that would sort of take away from that first one, but it's whatever works for you to get that time. Maybe it's 15 minutes before your kids wake up. So that way you can have a nice cup of coffee in the morning or exercise or read a book or watch a little bit of your favorite show, whatever that might be. Also making sure that we're working a little bit harder to have that support circle around us. So we might not be able to see our friends and family as much, but maybe we carve out that little bit of time to call them. Um, or even if it's sending an email, um, my mother-in-law is really into having Zoom with her college friends now, right? So people who haven't seen each other in a long time, just to have that circle of support. And finally, when we think about taking care of ourselves and self-care, one of the things to just keep in mind is that self-care is also setting limits and sometimes saying no, right? So if something's causing stress, maybe you're thinking of, you know, plans for this upcoming President's Day weekend. Um, and maybe it's just too much. And sometimes it's saying no and just focusing on the things that are important to you. And finally, just sort of paying attention that we're modeling taking care of ourselves for our kids. So if we want them to practice some of these things to be, you know, emotionally healthy and well, then we actually need to show them how to do that and model that for them. Okay. And I want to point out a few signs of um, stress in adults. So if these things are sounding true for you, then it might be time to focus a little bit more on that self-care. So here are some signs, so headaches, muscle tension. I know for me, it's always my upper back, right? My shoulders were, if I'm really stressed, I feel it there. Difficulty falling or staying asleep. So I like to joke that I do my best worrying in the middle of the night, right? So it's that to-do list. Um, chest pains or rapid heartbeat. Loss of appetite or overeating those comfort foods. Um, if you get sick more often when you're stressed, there's a reason for that, right? So, um, and that's why we also wanna take care of ourselves, especially during COVID, because when our amygdala is firing, so that part of the brain that's on the inside here, and we're going into fight, flight, or freeze more frequently, our immune system response is actually down. Okay, so lack of concentration or focus, memory problems or forgetfulness. If you think back to a time where you were incredibly stressed, um, you'll probably also now reflect that, oh gosh, yeah, I wasn't at my best self. I was having trouble remembering things, right? Jitters, irritability, short temper, and then anxiety. So, so just some things to look out for. If a few of these were like, oh yeah, I've definitely been a little bit more irritable lately, or I've had a little bit more of a short temper, it might be that you're a bit stressed and you're going to want to pay a little bit more attention to that self-care okay but again self-care shouldn't be something that stresses you out so just sort of being mindful of that so now i'm going to sort of transition into um i, I gave a very brief definition of what social emotional learning is um, and i want to now break that up in using castle's framework to really look at the different areas because what I'm going to do is break this down for the presentation so we can look at where our, our children are doing really well and where they might need some additional support, okay? So this is from CASEL, so they're the um, Collaborative of Academic and Social Emotional Learning, and they break up social emotional learning into these five domains, and I'm gonna go into each of them. And as I'm going into each of these, if you have you know, paper next to you, or if you wanna type in a Word document or use your phone, I want you to look at each of these categories, each of these domains, and sort of just put either whatever you feel comfortable with. Comfortable with. Maybe you're putting a plus or, or you know, a minus, maybe you're putting a happy face or um, some sort of marking for you of where your child's 
experiencing a lot of success and where you might want to spend a little bit more time because social emotional learning really does begin at home with all of us. Okay, so self awareness is the first domain. And for this one, this is really being in touch with oneself. So being able to recognize and label your own emotions. And then for older kids, knowing your strengths and limitations with a growth mindset. So what that means is knowing what you're really good at and then also recognizing what might be a little bit more challenging, but having that growth mindset. So knowing that, you know, if I spend a lot of time and effort, I can improve in this area over time. But in general for self-awareness, let's think of it as at first, being able to really be in tune with yourself, being able to label your own emotions. And um, Dr. Siegel, he's a great person in the field. He has come up with this phrase, if you name it, you can tame it. Okay, so the first step to self-management, which we'll talk about next, is actually being able to label your emotions. So I want you to reflect right now, is your child able to label his or her own emotions? Okay, does your child have a basic understanding of his or her strengths? And also know what might be a little bit more challenging, but looks at that with a growth mindset. Okay, so please take note of that, because that'll be important for some of the next slides. Okay, so the next area is self-management. This area is one that I'm a little bit more concerned about now during COVID because we're starting to hear about a lot more people having a hard time with um, not just regulating their emotions, but also just feelings of anxiety because there's a lot of stress during this time. So this is really important to widening that resiliency window like we spoke about before. So self-management is the ability to regulate emotions. So for instance, effectively managing stress, controlling impulses, which is hard for all kids, of course, right? And motivating oneself. Now, when we're thinking about this, you also want to make sure that you're thinking about it in an age appropriate way. Okay, we don't expect a five-year-old to be able to manage or control his or her impulses all day long, right? Or to manage stress on their own. But what we would hope that they would be able to do, again, is have that self-awareness to know what emotion they're feeling, and then even realize that asking you for help is a way that they can manage their emotions. Labeling at them, telling you, you know, I, I feel sad, I feel happy, I feel stressed, I feel nervous, right? And then what we'd want them to be able to do is to be able to pick a tool or a strategy to help calm themselves down when they need to. Okay, so we wouldn't expect them to necessarily do this all alone, but to maybe do this with some support. So if this is an area where, where you're a little bit concerned, you know, I've noticed that my child is a little bit more down lately. You know, they're having some down feelings, or I noticed that my child seems a little bit more worried or anxious lately, then this is an area that you'll want to focus on. So just make sure that you indicate that. Okay, the other area is social awareness. So remember, self-awareness is being aware of my own emotions. Social awareness is being able to be aware of other people's emotions to understand that there's other people have different perspectives and viewpoints. It's the ability to be able to empathize with them and also to understand the social norms for behavior. So maybe for instance, understanding that behavior that's expected of me um, when I'm outside at the park is very different than the behavior that's expected of me when I'm at school or if I'm at like church, for instance. Okay, so knowing that different locations have different norms for behavior too. Okay, so social awareness, of course, our kids are probably not practicing this as much lately, along with our next one, relationship skills. Okay, so this is the ability to make and maintain healthy relationships, so to cooperate with others, to communicate clearly, so having reciprocal conversations, so back and forth conversations, to be able to listen well, so not just with your ears, like I say with kids, but listening with your whole body, and then resolving conflict. Okay, so again, we wouldn't expect a five-year-old to be able to necessarily resolve conflict all by themselves. But what we would do is for our kids to be able to do this over time and with a little bit of help. Okay, the final one's responsible decision-making. So this is problem-solving. This is thinking through problems and consequences, right? I always like to give the example of 
Um, if it's cold outside, like it is right now, and I, you know, I actually forgot my jacket today, but let's say that you tell your child to put on their coat, right? And they don't want to wear their jacket and it's really cold for them to be able to think through, well, what are the potential consequences of not wearing my jacket? Maybe I'll get cold. Maybe I'm more likely to get sick, whatever it might be. Okay. And analyzing different situations. Of course, there's a lot more complex ones as our kids get older. So these are the five different domains. So if you haven't already done so, I'm actually going to give you a minute. And during that time, if you have a question, please pop it in um, the chat and I'll look there. And I want you just to think about what are my child's strengths and not necessarily weaknesses, but what are some areas where I might want to spend a little bit more time or a little bit more of my attention focusing on those areas. Okay, so if you could do that, and I'm just going to see, now's also a time to see if you have any questions, if you wanna put those in chat. All right. So I don't see anything. If somebody does, you're more than welcome to interrupt me, but I'm going to move on to now the different areas and what we can do to work on some of these skills, right? If these are things that we're concerned about. Um, Ms. Janulis, I have a question on the Spanish yes. chat. Yes, thank you. And let me let me read it and translate, please. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay, como ayudar en autocontrol sin que sienta. Okay, how to help my 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 child with self um, control um, without him or her feeling like pressure. Mm, that's a great question, right? Well, so how can I help my child um, with self control without making it feel like I'm pressuring him or her to do that, right? So we're actually going to go into each of these categories and talk about how to do some of those things. Um, and I'll spend a lot of time on, on self-control, but let me give you a little bit of an answer now. The best way to work on it is not when they actually need to work on it in the moment. So I want you to think of it this way. Let's say you're really upset and your friend or your spouse or your sibling or someone tells you to calm down. It actually makes you usually feel a little bit more anxious um, and maybe even angry, right? So the best way to work on these skills are, is actually when your child is calm. And for self-control, a big part of that is going to be through deep breathing. I know it sounds so basic, but it's taking that moment to take a breath. And most kids actually don't know how to do that properly. So I'll get to those slides in just a second, but I will make sure to come back to that too, but fantastic question. But the key to that is working on it when they're calm and practicing it together. Do we have any more questions on in either English or Spanish? All right, so let's go into the areas and then you might have questions as we go into the different ones. So self-awareness is the first one. Remember, the first step to that self-control or that self-management is actually being able to label and recognize your own emotions. So if you notice that your child's struggling in this area, how can you work on this? So the first thing is actually making sure that you're labeling your own emotions throughout the day. Sometimes our kids see us very calm and they just think that we're just naturally calm and that that's maybe why they're also feeling pressure when they're not, right? So what we wanna make sure that we do is that we label and share our own feelings. For instance, let's say that you are at the supermarket with your child and there's a really long line. Okay, and you're in that line and you're running late and you're really stressed out. That would be an opportunity to say to your child, oh my goodness, I'm really stressed or I'm anxious because there's a long line and we're running late. Okay, so you wanna share your emotions, but then here's the key, and this will help with that next piece, that self-management or that self-control piece, is then you wanna share what you do to help yourself remain calm during that time. Okay, so you can say, you know what? The line's really long, but 
Um, it's going to be okay if we're a little bit late or I'm going to take a deep breath or two deep breaths to calm down or I'm going to remember what I'm grateful for. Whatever it is that you do to sort of calm yourself, you want to share with your child. Okay, let's say that you're really sad because um, you haven't been able to see. So I'll share one for, for you all. Uh, my mom is pretty high risk, so I haven't been able to see her in about seven months now. Okay, so that's something that I'm really sad about. So I can, and I'm sure my child's really sad that she hasn't been able to see her grandmother. So that's something that I can share with my child. You know, oh gosh, I really miss, you know, I, and in my case, we call her Mimi. So I really miss Mimi. I haven't been able to spend time with her. That's sad. That makes me really sad. You know, and then I can share, but you know what? I'm grateful that we're trying um, to keep her safe and ourself healthy and safe. But you know what we can do? We can make sure that we can send her a card for Valentine's Day or we can FaceTime her or we can call her on the phone. Okay, um, or we can think of some of the fun things that we can do when we're together. So you want to make sure that you label your emotions with your kid, that you do this throughout the day, and you also share to work on that self-management piece, what you do to help keep yourself calm and regulated. You also want to check in with your child throughout the day and ask your child to name his or her feelings. And if they're struggling, to suggest some words for them and words beyond just happy, sad and mad. OK, especially as your child gets a little bit older, you're going to want to increase that vocabulary. You can say things like frustrated or worried or concerned, right? So really looking on increasing that vocabulary. Um, another thing, so again, ask your child, help them acknowledge and label your child's feelings. And a great way to do this is actually by reading kids books or reading books and watching movies and having your child work on labeling the emotions of the character. So that even gets into the social awareness piece a little bit, but that helps build over their vocabulary and start thinking about the feelings that other people are experiencing. Sometimes it's easier to do this with somebody else than themselves, okay? And again, just like you don't wanna start this when they're upset, yes, you can label and say, oh, it looks like you're a little bit upset right now, but maybe for themselves, you wanna start having them label their emotions when it looks like they're happy or experiencing joy. OK, so just pretty basic things here for them to be aware of their own feelings. And for our older kids, you want them to be aware of their own feelings and some of the things that may have led to them feeling that way. OK, so maybe they're doing a really fun activity and that's why they're feeling so happy. Right. Or maybe they had a lot of work to do, so they're feeling a little bit stressed. OK, or you ask them to clean their room and so they're feeling a little bit upset about that. So that's sort of that next step. And here's the big one is self management, right? So we talked about this before with the question with self control. So it's really important here again that we first start working on this when our kids are calm, but that we're also when we're doing that teaching and modeling positive ways to manage stress, anxiety and disappointment when our kids are calm first. OK, so I talked about breath. So a great way to do this is by actually teaching your child how to take deep breaths. I know that sounds silly, but if you ask a kid to take a deep breath, most of them will do this. <gasps> right. And the whole idea of taking a deep breath is that it slows down our heart rate. And when you do that, it actually increases our heart rate and it does just the opposite. It'll actually lead them to feel more stressed. So there's several ways that you can do this. One of the fun ways that I like to do this is by having kids first put their hands so they can feel their pulse. So either right here or it's just easier for a lot of our little ones to put their hands over their hearts and say, OK, just feel your heart rate, right? Um, feel your heart beating. How fast is it beating? Oh, it's beating kind of slow, right? Not all right. I feel it. Then you have them run in place for a minute and it's really fun if you join them. OK, so you're running as fast as you can. That'll help with the movement one, too, right? You're running as fast as you can for a minute and their heart's beating really, really fast. So you have them put the, their hand over their heart after that minute. You put your hand over yours or or feel your pulse and they'll say, oh, my gosh, my heart is beating so fast. We're like, absolutely. When else does it beat really fast? So they might say, oh, when I'm really angry and you're like, yeah, when you're angry, your heart rate does increase. What else? Or maybe when I'm really stressed or worried about something, if I have to give a presentation in class or um, if I am asking someone to play and I haven't played with them before, whatever it might be, that could sort of be a little bit stressful for your kid. Right. Or that can cause them to be upset when I'm really angry at my brother. Right. I get really stressed out. My heart beats fast. 
Then you have them practice at least 10 deep breaths. So there's several ways to do this. An easy way is that you have them breathe in through their nose to a count of three, and you count for them. Okay, so you can go one Mississippi, two Mississippi, however you wanna do that. And then out through their mouth to a count of five. That forces them to go really slow. Okay, another fun way is belly breathing, right? So you have them breathe in and feel their belly get bigger and then really slow out and have them feel their belly get smaller. Um, you could do crazy eight breathing where they make an eight, right? So they're breathing in through this side of an eight and breathing out through that side of an eight. I called it crazy eight. It's actually really called lazy eight breathing. So I think I'm just thinking of the game. But anyhow, there's lots of ways to do that, but you have them take 10 deep breaths and then you have them put their hand over their heart or you have them feel their pulse. And what most kids will tell you is, oh my gosh, it's so much slower, it's slowed down. And some of them get very excited about this and you're like, yes, deep breaths help us slow down our heart rate. They help us calm down. Okay, another way is through mindfulness. So mindfulness is not just practice when you're stressed, but mindfulness is being able to be in the present moment and you have to practice it. And it's usually done through guided breathing. And what's really exciting is that 17 of our schools just received a grant through Kaiser to have a program called Inner Explorer, um, which works on mindfulness. And the remaining schools will still get access. Um, Inner Explorer was kind enough to give 20 practices to our remaining schools. And there will be a training next month. Um, the date and time is to be determined. But families will have access to this program through an app. So you can actually practice in English or Spanish mindfulness with your kids at home. I highly recommend it. We all benefit for, um, from it. And again, it's important that we do this with our kids. Okay, another thing you can talk to your kids about is, you know, for me, when I get stressed, something that really helps is if I go for a walk. So when I come home from work and my husband comes home from work, usually what we do is we go for a walk with the family, we get out, we stretch our legs, it helps us all de-stress, right? So if you're feeling stressed, again, you're labeling that emotion and self-awareness, and then for self-management, you're saying, you know, I'm feeling a little bit stressed, will you come for a walk with me? Or I notice that it seems like you're a little bit stressed or sad or angry, you know, let's try going for a walk. Or if we have a lot of time, let's try going and playing a little bit, right? So for us, we might call it exercising, but for our kids, it's really movement and play. Another idea is if you just sort of need to get those feelings out, right? So something about mindfulness, you're being, you're made, um, sorry, you're becoming aware of the feeling, you're acknowledging it, and then you're kind of letting it go. Journaling is a great way to do that. For kids, it could be writing down their feelings, or it could be drawing pictures of their feelings. Often times kids have a much easier time writing or drawing it than talking about it. And so it's giving your child a way to express themselves. Some parents will give their child a journal or a sketchbook. You can even just make one by stapling paper, right? And then allowing your child an opportunity daily or weekly to share that with you if they want to, okay? Um, and again, if you do these things, if you model what you're doing for your kids, then that's going to be way more effective. And there's something called co-regulation, and that's the idea of we don't expect our kids to be able to regulate really on their own. It's we do it together. And that, again, with that question that was asked, that'll take off some of the pressure of, no, this is something that we all need to work on together, and we're all going to do this together. So it's not just you, okay? So it's, again, it's modeling how we do it, and doing that with our kids. So we also need to be mindful and make sure that we are regulated ourselves. Okay, so that's why that first part was on self-care. And I want to, I shared the signs of adults and stress. Here are some signs for kids. Some of them are the same. I highlighted some ones that might be a little bit different. So if your child's showing that sudden change in behavior, uh, this is usually a regression. So bedwetting's on there, but that's an easy example. So let's say that your child's eight, they haven't had an accident since they were three, and all of a sudden they started wetting the bed, right? So that's a sign of some pretty significant stress potentially, okay? Um, but those sudden changes in behavior is something that you might want to sort of be made aware of and a, a way to sort of even schedule in some of that self uh, care time for your child, right? So it might be, okay, we're going to have time just to play, just to have some downtime, to go for a walk, to journal, whatever it is that's calming for your child. 
um, scheduling some of that time for them. Another thing, adults will often overeat comfort foods. Kids usually lose their appetite. Okay, and then we all feel what we call somatic symptoms, but for kids, typically when they're stressed or, or feeling kind of low, it's often headaches and tummy aches that they talk about. Okay, we mentioned bedwetting. Another one, yes, we might all have trouble going to sleep, but our kids tend to have nightmares, a lot of nightmares when they're under stress. And then the development of a nervous habit. So, you know, before I didn't notice something, all of a sudden now they're really biting their nails a lot during this particular time of the day when it seems like they're stressed. Or maybe they're pulling at their hair. So sort of just looking for some of those nervous habits. Those are some of those warning signs where we wanna backtrack and say, okay, we need to spend some more time doing calming activities and openly talking to our kids. And I don't want you to be afraid of when your child's calm, right? So when they're not experiencing those heavy emotions, just talking to them openly and sharing your own experiences. Sometimes it's easier to do this with books here are some books that I recommend, particularly for stress, because that's what we're hearing the most about right now. But when my worries get too big, um, Wilma Jean, the worry machine, that's the picture right there that you see. For kids that are maybe in third or fourth grade and up, stress can really get on your nerves is a fun one. And then for our children who are a little bit older, but really having a significant um, difficulty with this. The coping skills workbooks, there's several that are on stress, are great um, resources. They're just fantastic. But that's when we're a little bit more concerned and not just something that we in general want to talk about. But those are some overall things. But I think the most important thing for your child and working on self-management or self-regulation um, or self-control, as we talked about before, is sort of letting them know that it's something that we all need to work on, that you work on on a regular basis, sharing with them the things that you do, asking, giving them lots of different options, asking what might be helpful for them to try, and then doing it together as a family. Okay, and it might mean that, you know, for them, st a stress reducer might be playing Lego, so it might be something that you guys are doing and having some fun together. Okay, so social awareness. So we talked about self-awareness is being aware of your own feelings and emotions. And social awareness is being aware of feelings and emotions of others. Okay, a great way to do this again is through books um, or also movies, but I recommend these books. Um, they're appropriate for all different elementary ages. Uh, the first two are big tear jerkers, The Invisible Boy and Somebody Loves You, Mr. Hatch. So Somebody Loves You, Mr. Hatch is a Valentine's Day book, so it might be one to look at now. I have a 10-month-old, so she's definitely way too young for this, but I bought it anyhow, and I was trying not to tear up as I was reading it. So it's about a man who um, really is kind of socially isolated, keeps to himself, and he gets a Valentine, a box of chocolates, a huge box of chocolates, and it, he's so excited, he doesn't know who it's from. It's like a secret admirer, so he shares it with everybody. And he starts forming these amazing relationships and experiencing joy. And then he gets the news that that was accidentally delivered to him. And I won't give away the ending, but I promise you it's a happy ending. And it really gets us to think about other people. And these books can be very helpful for our kids in building these social emotional skills, especially now as they're not able to spend as much time with their friends and peers. Um, another fantastic one, How Full Is Your Bucket? There's two, I particularly like this, this version that's shown here, um, but both are great. And the premise of this book, a lot of teachers use this with their kids, is that everybody has an invisible bucket and that we can either fill somebody's bucket by doing kind things or we can accidentally or purposely, I guess, dip from somebody's bucket by doing unkind things or not thinking about somebody. So it teaches you some of those things that you can do to fill somebody's bucket and it works on that perspective taking um, and it's just creates that great common language that you can use at home especially as kids are spending more time with siblings and there's probably conflict and then you can use that language with your child well you know did you fill jonathan's bucket or when you did that did you dip from his bucket right so it gives you that common language stand in my shoes is another good one um, if you're working, so another part of social awareness is norms, so behavior norms, and you are a social detective, it's not up here, but that's another great book um, that you can have to sort of work on expected and unexpected behavior. And all these books are available on Amazon as well as the local library. Your schools even probably have several that you can check out from the library. Um, and again, Somebody Loves You, Mr. Hatch, oh, that one just, it, it gets to me each time. 
So um, for social awareness, I really would recommend starting there. And then you also want to ask your kid as you're reading these books, don't just read them. You want to have a conversation. How is that person feeling? How would you feel if this happened to you? Um, when something happens with their, maybe their sibling at home. Yeah, well, how do you think, you know, um, Susie felt when you did that? You know, how would you feel if that happened? And then, you know, we'll get into this later with the relationship skills, but what can you do to make things right? So you can see that these domains kind of build upon one another as that they get more challenging, but it requires skills from the others to really, um, to really experience things. So our next one is relationship skills. I know that many of you might have sort of targeted this one and said, you know, my child just doesn't has, have enough time to practice this with peers. But I want us, you know, we've been in COVID for almost 11 months now, and I want us to really think about what are the opportunities? Yes, there's lots of downfalls, tons of, of, of things that we're concerned about. Well, what are the opportunities? Are you able to spend more time with your child, you know, and, and trying to think about how we can leverage those opportunities. And one way to work on relationship skills at home with your family is just by having dinner table conversations. Okay, so a big part of relationship skills is communication. And communication also means listening. Um, so it's those listening skills as well. So it's putting down our phone and modeling those skills for our child, showing them whole body listening. So I always teach kids that we don't just listen with our ears, but we listen with our eyes by looking at the speaker. We listen by our mouth by waiting our turn to speak. Um, we listen with our brain by making sure that we're thinking about the thing that the other person's talking about and not just about the next thing we're going to say. We listen with our hands and our body by having a calm body and not moving around the whole time. But we don't just want to teach this, we also want to model it. So sometimes that means we actually need to put some of our things away too. But sitting down, having conversations with our kids, um, there are monthly SEL family newsletters that go out. I'll show you where to access those. And there are actually table topics in each one. So if you're looking for some fun topics to have at the dinner table to work on some of these skills, they're there. Um, another thing I always recommend is sort of swapping out a family movie night for a family game night. Uh, board games are fantastic for working on relationship skills. Your child can learn how to um, win respectively as well as lose respectively, right? You're not just letting them, being respectful when they lose, you're not just letting them win each time. They learn how to take turns. Um, they learn perspective taking skills during these times, conflict situations. And then also when there is conflict with your kids, which is a lot of times will most likely be with siblings during COVID, rather than giving them advice or telling them what to do or separating the kids, just asking questions instead. So again, what do you think your sister was feeling when that happened? Well, what do you think you need to do to make things right? So allowing them the processing time to come up with the solution rather than giving that to them, okay? For responsible decision-making, so this is sort of the last one in the domain that builds upon all the others. It's discussing possible consequences like I talked about with the jacket example in the beginning, right? So what are the possible consequences of that? So yeah, you know, you have your planned, and, and this sounds silly now, like we're not, a lot of kids aren't meeting in person. So you're supposed to um, have a Zoom or a FaceTime with one of your friends and you don't feel like doing that, you wanna cancel. Okay, well, what are some possible consequences? How might your friend feel, right? Sort of talking about that. And then here are my, my favorite, these are restorative questions. So after conflict happens, if your child, you know, potentially caused harm to a sibling, to you, to somebody else, here are some great questions to ask. Take a picture of the slide. Um, look at your phone when you're asking them. It's okay. A lot of our kids are used to these questions, but there's, there's two I wanna kind of spend some time talking about. The first one is that typically when something happens, we usually ask our kids, our first question tends to be, why did you do that? Okay, I want you to think about that for a second. If you did something and you didn't mean to cause harm, but you did, you hurt your spouse's feelings. And so I'll, I'll say it with my husband. So let's say I accidentally hurt my husband's feelings. And he said to me, Elizabeth, why did you do that? I'm not going to respond super positively. I'm probably going to get really defensive. Uh, and at the end of the day, there's never a good answer to that. It's usually, I don't know if we're able to even respond, if we're not super angry about it, right? So if you can just work on changing that language and joining your child and working together, kind of sort of that co-regulation that we talked about. So instead of why did you do that? Just ask, well, what happened? 
I think what you'll find is that your child will be less likely to shut down and more likely to talk to you. But again, we don't want to do this if your child's really upset. They just got in a fight with their sibling. First, give them time. So that's probably when they flip their lid, right? So the resiliency window's narrowed. We don't want to ask them when they're really upset. Give them a few minutes to calm down first. Okay, allow them, give them some space, allow them to calm down. And when they seem calm enough, that's when you can say, you know, well, Jonathan, let's talk about this. What happened? Okay, and you're sitting with them and problem solving with them. And here are the next ones. But if you only remember two, it's the first one and the last one. What? So the next question would be, what were you thinking of at the time? Okay, so you're working on that perspective taking. Okay, what have you thought about since? And you can change the words for younger kids. Who has been affected by what you have done and in what way? So a lot of times our kids realize what happened to them and how they felt, but they don't realize that their actions actually caused harm to another person. So that's what helps with that one. And here's the, the next most important. So if you only remember two, what happened and what do you think you need to do to make things right? Okay, and so for little kids, they might say, well, I need to say I'm sorry, and that's completely age appropriate. But let's say that you have a fourth grader and a sixth grader, and your sixth grader hit your fourth grader, and they just say, oh, I'm going to say I'm sorry. I'm pretty sure your fourth grader is still going to have a memory about that and have some feelings. So saying you're sorry might be the first step, but what else do they need to do to really repair that harm? Okay, I need to keep my hands to myself. Maybe I need to let my brother go first, you know, whatever it is, sort of talking to them about that. Okay, and really working on that problem solving, but please feel free to take a picture of these slides, especially this one, um, and remembering to use those questions. I use them, I'm so guilty of using them at home, um, and my husband now knows and he'll use these questions on me, and I've realized that he's caught on to my ways, um, but they really do help process, and it, again, it helps you if you're on that side, if my husband came up to me one day and said, what happened? I would be very open to talking to him versus, you know, why did you do that? Which sounds pretty harsh, like you're upset or you're in trouble. OK, so I um, am going to show you a resource and I'm going to show you how to access our newsletters online. And then after that, I'm going to leave it open for questions. OK, so start thinking of those questions or even putting them in chat if you have them. But I want to share this first. So let's say that you have some more concerns for your child and you feel like they may really need counseling um, or some additional help during this time. I want to pay some attention to our family resource centers are just amazing. OK, so you can access those through your schools, but this is the website, too, if you want to go directly yourself. Um, if your child has Medi-Cal, um, then they can get counseling through South Bay Community Services. The numbers there, they are just fantastic. Um, private insurance, you're going to usually want to just turn your insurance card over and call the number on the back. Um, because, for instance, let's say you have Kaiser, you would go directly through Kaiser to get counseling. But I also included the number of a local agency that takes private insurance in case you're interested. But again, you usually want to go through your insurance and call them. And if something's really urgent and you need help, you know, today, um, there is through Radies a behavioral urgent care where you can actually get support same day without an appointment. So their numbers there, they're in mid city, um, but they are an excellent resource as well in case you need that. So before questions, I'm gonna, I wanna just share something with you quickly. So I'm gonna stop my slides. So you guys can see this is our district website. And I just wanna show you something here. If you go here and you go to the spot that says parents, there's something that says my child's learning. And then if you look under my child's learning, there's a social emotional learning section. OK, so again, district website under parents. My child's learning then social emotional learning. If you click there. This is where all there's a lot of information here and resources, but you'll also see that there's a virtual classroom each month. So this month the focus is on collaborative conversations and there's newsletters in English and Spanish that go out monthly as well as all the links to the old ones. So there's lots of amazing resources here and then some links for resources there as well. So please check out our newsletters. It looks like um, we have well over 300 people um, that looked at 
the one for February, but please look at those. Um, they're, they're fantastic resources for you guys to have, especially for help during COVID-19 and how to support your, your student or your child with social emotional learning. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that way I'm available to answer questions. And I just ask for our employees who are on, if you wouldn't help, um, mind helping me just look at the chat in English and Spanish. Sharing. All right, you can also feel free to unmute yourself if you want to ask a question too. We have a parent, uh, Cooper Beckman, who or Beckman Cooper, who had a just a comment. Reflect on our emotions is something we do, and just realize that we have forgotten to label our emotions. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. And some in agreement and what you had shared that it was awesome, but I don't see any questions unless somebody let's oh, maybe here. Um, someone asking, will the presentation be available to us after today? Thank you. We will make the presentation available and do our best to get that on the district web page today, if not tomorrow. And another uh, a fam uh, family member or parent, thank you for the resources. I was about to ask about that, so about the recording, yes. And if you are interested or you feel that you have a friend who is interested, there's going to be a whole series of social emotional learning presentations that are done starting in February. Those dates will be announced um, by Dr. Escobedo at um, next week when he uh, has a town hall meeting. Uh, and you can look for those going out in School Messenger as well. See, um, in the Sp uh, interpretation to Spanish, do we have any questions in the meeting chat? I'm sorry, I'm not at my computer. Uh, no, no questions on the Spanish side. Thank you. OK. Well, it looks like we don't have any additional questions or comments, so I thank you so much, Miss Elizabeth. We really appreciate your expertise and sharing all the great resources that are available to our families in Chula Vista Elementary School District. All right, you're very welcome. It was really nice to present to you all today, and I look forward to seeing some familiar names and faces at our upcoming presentations that we have. Thank you.